Welcome to the session today. Thank you so much for coming out on a Thursday evening, 5.30. And I know that we're all that stands between you and probably some alcoholic beverage and the party, lady, part, uh, the, the, the party later. So definitely appreciate you coming out. My name is Stephen Jones. I'm with AWS. And uh, I'm uh, pleased to uh, be here with uh, Philip from Brooks Brothers. Uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, their journey to the cloud uh, for a couple of their solutions around SAP. Um, just some background on me. So I run a team of solution architects that focus specifically on the SAP workload. And uh, we work directly with uh, SAP on certification efforts. I'll talk a little bit about that and what that looks like. But uh, we're primarily here to hear about Brooks and their journey. So I'll turn some time over to you. All right, thanks, Steve. So what do you, can you expect from this session? We're going to cover our journey, the business drivers that took us to the cloud, and the product selection of SAP, product selection of HANA as a database platform within SAP, as well as why we selected AWS. And we'll cover some of the lessons that we learned along the way, and also give you a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing next in our journey. So Brooks Brothers, we are a clothing uh, company. We make men's and women's clothing. We've been in business since 1818. We are a manufacturer, wholesaler, retailer. We're worldwide. We have e-commerce. We have mobile. We have all of the challenges that come with managing a large global enterprise. And we do this with innovation in mind. Since our founding, we have innovated in the apparel space. Uh, we created the first ready-to-wear suits, the wrinkle-free shirts, and many other improvements in American style and apparel. So as we've gone through the last 30 to 40 years at Brooks Brothers, we've seen a shift, global business. And for us, global is not just from a bricks and mortar store perspective, it is from an e-commerce perspective, it is from the viewpoint of the customer interacting with us through the e-commerce channels, and now, of course, mobile. And these changes in the way that we do business have changed our view of the customer from a data perspective. You know, it used to be very simple. We stored all of the information about our customer in a little black book. So each sales associate worked with a particular customer base, and all that personalized information was stored in a little black book. So our first attempt at gathering the customer data electronically was just to replicate what we have always done in the manual system. But as we grow, we needed harmonized systems. We needed that same data available to a call center. We needed that same data available to the customer when they're self-consuming their services. And so these harmonized systems require a harmonized platform that can bring this single view of the customer. So we did a number of in-house solutions for a while, and then we decided that we needed to select a, a mainstream partner. And for this, that we selected SAP and their customer activity repository, customer relationship modules. And this enables us to set the stage for that customer data to be accessible and consumable in all of the different places that we interact with that customer. Additionally, we're making a lot of other changes in our back-end ERP systems, the merchandising, the assortment planning solutions, as well as in our point of sale. So we want real-time data interaction. We want to enable that content to be accessible and accurate. So what did we do? We built a new customer contact center application. We leveraged SAP's HANA in-memory database platform to do that, and not only for the customer activity repository, but also the CRM solution and their integration layers. And so what do we have to connect it to? Legacy ERP, which is both an SAP ECC solution as well as a JDA-based platform. Telephony, we use a Shortel-based telephone system. For our customer contact center, we need to make sure that real-time integration is there so that when the customer calls in, we have available to the agent that information the customer has chosen to share with us. Then SaaS solutions for data cleansing, and now that real-time POS data. This is not easy. 
When we first conceived of this project, it was a little less than a year ago. And so we had a very short time frame to market, which then became more compressed due to some compliance reasons that I will uh, articulate in a little bit. So we had a project timeline of about nine months that we wanted to reduce to somewhere between three and six months. We had capacity constraints, lots and lots of data about the customer, multiple dimensions, and it's in all kinds of different places and we need to bring it together. And we decided to use the HANA platform and to bring that in-house on our own HANA database, uh, we, we didn't have sufficient storage. So we were looking at having to buy an additional appliance at a very high price point. We also wanted to elevate ourselves from a security perspective. We wanted full end-to-end -end data encryption, both at, uh, at rest and in motion. We wanted to be able to have assurance for our cyber risk insurance partners that our data was secure. And everybody cares about cost. Uh, we are certainly no exception to that. We wanted to make sure that the costs were accurate and predictable and that we could articulate back to the various different business units that are utilizing this data what they needed to drive from a revenue perspective. We'll go back one there, it didn't want to. Okay, so at Brooks Brothers, we decided that we needed to have a different view of the cloud. So many of my friends who are in a similar position heading up an infrastructure team have struggled with articulating to their engineering associates why we're going to a cloud-based platform, uh, particularly for an operations staff who may be very worried about how this affects their career with the company. So you can view it from a doom and gloom perspective as an engineer that all those things that I, I love, that I trained my VMware, my high-end OLTP databases, all of these things are now out of my control and in the hands of uh, a nameless person sitting uh, somewhere in the world. But we wanted to have a different perspective about how it opens up new horizons for our associates. So we wanted to craft a message that talked to them specifically about for your role in the organization, this is what it means to learn the new skills around AWS. And we obviously, as we went along this journey, we didn't land immediately on AWS. We looked at all of the major players in this industry and we decided that we had to ask a series of questions in order to select the right partner. So we began with what are the traditional questions that we've asked ourselves for every infrastructure decision we've made in the past? What would we do if we wanted to co-locate? What are the questions that we need to answer? You know, SOC 2, type 2s, uh, you know, how do you secure data access? What's your network bound with all of those types of questions? We wanted to know if we were to do this in-house, how would we architect for those same decisions that we've already made? We want to be secure, we want to have high performance. What would we do in-house? We also thought very carefully about the existing solutions and the opportunity that we would have if we started from scratch. So this concept of a, of a do-over really led us to think about how the data comes in, how the data is manipulated, massaged, and how it moves out. We looked very closely at web services versus bringing in uh, flat file database uh, extracts, for example. And then total cost of ownership. And I challenge you, have you ever really done a TCO study? When you've looked at TCO, have you looked at it just from a pure mathematical perspective and said, okay, I'm spending this amount on my server hardware, I'm spending this amount on my resources? Because from my experience, and I've done lots of TCO for various companies, we've never been as honest as we should be about the cost of retraining resources, about the missed opportunities that come, the number of servers that we stood up in a dev cycle only to abandon a project because it wasn't reaching its full potential. So I challenge you think about that cost benefit equation. You know, the traditional one is benefits divided by costs. Throw in opportunity into that, throw in the innovation value you get 
from selecting a solution, a partner stack that enables you to grow in places that you haven't yet uh, experienced. So when you add in that opportunity benefit, and as you've seen from, from this conference, uh, Amazon particularly, they add in new solutions, they constantly reevaluate the price for the system that you're installing. So that really drives a lot of future value. And it was those coupled with our infrastructure imperatives which led us to determine that Amazon was the right partner. These four principles of security, network, speed and agility and reliability are the same things that hopefully everybody has been uh, using within their infrastructure stack for the last five to 10 years. And so as we look at cloud, it has to be within that same dimension. So we now just say we have an additional data center. It happens to be located uh, in Amazon's premises, but we don't treat it as though it is an asset for them. We treat it as though it is our asset. And that's really helped from a DevOps perspective of people taking ownership, not just of the reliability and availability of the total solution, but also the cost of running those systems out there. And the benefit that we hope to get out of the overall relationship is that we can lower that cost for aging systems. Maybe uh, as you look at your speed that you purchased for a system seven, eight years ago, you might have uh, overloaded it from a memory perspective or CPU perspective, and now the customer base has dwindled down to those three or four uh, evangelists for that solution. They think they really, really need it, but uh, the rest of the world's kind of moved on and you're just kind of holding that system alive for them. Move it into the cloud, you can lower the cost of running that particular instance. So all of these helped us understand where AWS could fit into the, the model here. We had those infrastructure imperatives and this decision around SAP and HANA really crystallized this decision for Amazon because we needed a vendor who understood SAP, who recognized that SAP certification for a HANA solution was critical to us, the customer. I cannot have the risk in my organization that if we're having a performance challenge that the SAP team says, well, I'm sorry, if you're running on a certified HANA instance, we'd be happy to help you, but Hasta la vista, we're, 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 it's not us, it's, it's your fault. So that combined with operational excellence, we did not want to have to overthink the supportability of Linux. We didn't want to have to uh, worry about some of the uh, finer grain details of network connectivity for failover and redundancy. So Amazon brought all of these things together in this nice little picture for us. Uh, now we actually have little pictures that show you how these things go together. Our journey was sort of uh, more incremental of understanding it. But it did align with that value equation very well for us. And our partners, which included IBM from an architecture and strategic direction, as well as uh, development team members from two different outsourcing entities, they really understood how to engage and utilize the systems within the AWS infrastructure. And very important is this concept of transparency and trust. We wanted Amazon to trust us when we said, you know, we'd really like some flexibility as we try out some of these things. We wanted them to trust us that if they were successful, that we would move forward in this relationship. And vice versa, we wanted to know that they were not going to leave us and abandon us if something didn't go quite right, because we have been very experimental in some of the things that we've done in the last year. So security, we touched on a little bit, and we were very satisfied with the controls that Amazon brought to the table. And it's very helpful for us, of course, that you can uh, rely on all those different audits, that whether it's SOC 2, SOC 1, PCI, HIPAA compliance, NERC SIP, they're, they're all there. They also enabled us to implement a VPC right out of the gate. So when we started, we uh, were very low cost, very quick point of entry. 
which we were then able to follow up later with a, a direct connect situation. Security groups, very, very easy because you start off in a position of strength, whereas a lot of the time when you build things in-house, you're under a lot of pressure from the developers, you cut corners, you don't have time to do the things, especially from an SAP basis perspective, that you might know that you should do. You get at least a little bit of a head start with how Amazon pre-configures some of these solutions. Native support for disk encryption in the EBS volumes was a lifesaver for us. We very much needed to get a, a particular set of data encrypted and we were not sure whether we could rely on the underlying uh, encryption methods within the application. So doing the data at rest right in the volume was fabulous for us. And of course, the, the robust nature of the identity and access management brought up for us the ability to put multi-factor authentication in without any incremental cost or delay to our project. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about all of the experience with cloud security that you brought to the table? Sure. I won't spend too much time on this because it's a fascinating story. But there are three main pillars to the security model at, a at AWS, and we do take security very seriously. And the first one is visibility. So within, uh, within the AWS console through API calls, you can instantly get access to information about your entire environment, uh, again, within one single, single view. And this is often very difficult to do in an on-premise uh, environment. We also have uh, other services like uh, AWS CloudTrail, which give you very fine-grained uh, logging uh, that you can actually go and do uh, very detailed audits uh, after the fact. Um, this is something that we, we see customers doing a lot. Uh, on the control side, you actually have control where your data lies. So if you place data within a region, we will not move that data unless you ask us to do it so, do so, whether it's through a snapshot copy or other methods that, that, that we expose. So that's really entirely under your control. So from a data privacy perspective, this is entirely uh, something that the customer can, can choose. And we have this concept of a shared responsibility model when it comes to security. So as Philip alluded, we control uh, the physical layer, uh, the data center uh, protection and the, and the systems themselves, all the way up through the hypervisor layer and to the, secure, the security of the virtualization stack. And then uh, in, in conjunction with a partner or a customer uh, themselves can actually, from the operating system on up through the application stack, um, take control of the security from an application perspective. But as Philip alluded, we do provide uh, very good guidance on pre-configured uh, setups and configurations for SAP, and especially SAP HANA. Uh, and then from an audit perspective, what we're finding is that uh, a lot of customers can actually take advantage of many of the uh, audit compliance work that we've done in, in order to make their, uh, their environments more uh, auditable from a, a risk perspective. Uh, so this is, this is the three pillars to our security, security platform. Philip? So I mentioned that we started off with a VPC-based connection, and we had that up and running within uh, about 10 hours of making uh, the decision that we would leverage this AWS platform. And just that experience alone gave us a great deal of comfort that we'd selected the right partner because we did run into some challenges. And instead of calling our account rep and screaming at him, we decided to test the system. So we put in the service call, and we were shocked when about 30 minutes later, a live human being called us back who actually knew how to solve the problem. That was a game changer for us just out of the gate. We also have that global footprint within the different availability zones. And we had some developers that would benefit from us locating some of our development systems in the Dublin data center, as well as us wanting some of our QA environments located uh, more proximate to where we are. So being able to get up and running and enable the developer to access certain pieces over the open internet for us to come in through our proprietary network was very good. As we moved from this uh, development cycle to now the closed environment for production, we move forward with Direct Connect. So our, and I keep saying, it, it feels like it's my data center. 
my Amazon data center is connected into my MPLS network. I can see and have full visibility and I have the speed that I need to process these transactions as well as the uh, security that comes with that private network. So it's just another segment on our network. All of the controls that I have in place for my on-premise data center, for my data centers that are located at other buildings, uh, manufacturing sites, it, it's, it's all one and the same for us, which is um, so good for our end users. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you're accessing the CRM solution from the New York offices, from a store, or from uh, the, the contact center, your speed and performance are about equal because you're hooking into that Verizon-based backbone. So that's been very helpful for us. Would you like to explain a little bit better some of the, the technical side of those direct connects? No worries. So how many of you are familiar with uh, AWS VPC, the VPC concept? So most of you. So quick, quick overview, the VPC is a virtual private cloud. It's basically electronic isolation, which you have full control over. You can define uh, the entire address range of the virtual private cloud. And it can, and oftentimes, customers will actually, again, as, as uh, Brooks Brothers has done, uh, actually extend their on-premise network with a similar IP address range, such that it becomes just another segment on their, on their network. Now, uh, Philip alluded to, in the beginning, they actually started with a hardware VPN connection, it's a standard IPsec tunnel over the internet, and then quickly uh, migrated to a direct connect connection. And at AWS, we offer uh, connect different connection speeds depending on uh, your requirements. So you can uh, provision up to one gig or 10 gig links, or even multiples of those. Uh, if your bandwidth needs are not that, uh, that, uh, that much, you can actually provision smaller ones through some of our direct connect partners. And uh, again, it becomes a very secure uh, connection. The other thing about VPC is there doesn't have to be any exposure to or from the internet if you don't want to. Many of our customers actually control all access to their resources on AWS through their on-premises network and over that direct connect or either that VPN tunnel. Yeah, and for us, we were very concerned about latency. You can see in our diagram here that we have a, the call center with the telephony integration. So our phone system needed to be able to reach out and communicate with the car and the CRM solution in near real time, as well as setting us up for the future. So our current point of sale solution is not as advanced as the one that we're in the process of rolling out. As our new system comes in, it is real-time trickle polling, and all of that customer data needs to enter into the CRM solution immediately. Because we have things such as, you know, order in one store and pay for it and then go pick it up uh, later at a different store, or the ability to, in, in the future, synchronize information from e-commerce back into the, the point of sale system. So if you're thinking about making a purchase and maybe you've gone up to the, the, the website, you've created an account out there, you've given us some of your personal information, but then you decide to go into a brick and mortar store, we don't want it to be, well, after the batch cycle is run for two days, then we have that information available. So this whole ability to control latency through Direct Connect was very important to us. You know, this is a complex landscape. We've got integrations coming in from our SaaS provider. We've got data transformations. And the speed of the SAP HANA environment was vital to our ability to do this. For those of you that aren't necessarily familiar with HANA, the entire data is stored in memory. And so the speed of access is about as fast as it is uh, possible to achieve. And we've done that for both the, the, the activity repository, which takes the, that sort of real-time real data streaming in and the CRM application, which provides that set of user interfaces in for the folks that are accessing it. So you can see here, there's the path from the ERP system into uh, the AWS cloud. And then our users follow that same path there. And that's given us a lot of, of speed and agility to be successful in meeting the business needs. So what do we get out of selecting AWS? We had our new compute resources just a click away. We started with some instant sizes 
that were perhaps a little larger than we needed in some cases and not fast enough in others. So we were able to just use the GUI and make those adjustments without delaying our developers. If we had chosen to do this in-house, even though we have a very robust virtualization platform, we don't necessarily have enough compute capacity on all of the hypervisors to have that same level of flexibility in a minute or two of time frame for delivery. That regional utilization, as I mentioned, with our developers being able to access resources in Dublin, certainly helped us speed up some of the development cycle. And we've been able to right-size the solution over time. We're now running some of the very largest instances that are available, and we're very excited that we're going to be able to get even larger as we start putting more data into this system. An absolute huge win for us. And I'm sure those of you that have been in infrastructure for a long time, you launch into production and you hear, well, it worked better in QA. And you say, what do you mean it worked better in QA? Well, you must have done something different with the hardware in QA to prod. I don't have that discussion anymore. I can prove to them empirically that it's exactly the same. I can even move it, swap it if I want to. So that's taken a lot of those arguments away. So now the developers and the people that are working on data say, data first, right? Uh, there must be a change in how we loaded the data or index optimization, things along those lines. And the top win for us was the automated deployment scripts for, for HANA. So we could have gone through the process of building our own Linux servers out. We could have uh, downloaded all the OSS notes. We could have installed HANA ourselves and spent about six weeks trying to get it working, troubleshooting it. We were provided scripts that just automated that whole piece. And then at the end of the day, you have a certified HANA environment to run on. And I'm going to let Steve talk to this one. But uh, we, we had to constrain that uh, planning horizon. And so why don't you explain sure. what that looks like from an AWS perspective? Sure. How many of you have uh, sized SAP environments today with QuickSizer? Yeah? OK, everybody's familiar with that. How many uh, of you find that the, maybe the initial sizing you do is really accurate to the, the hardware you purchase, end up purchasing? Or you really have a, a good confidence level? That, uh, <laughs> right? And, and it's not because of the quick sizer, right? It's because uh, oftentimes in SAP projects, we don't quite know going in all the functionality that's actually going to be implemented, right? And we end up, there's this thing called scope creep, right, that tends to happen. And we end up doing customization and other things that require more hardware. And, and we also find that we want a little bit of insurance policy, right? We don't want to run out of compute. And so we buy just a little bit more. And oftentimes, we find ourselves in a situation where we've, we've just over oversubscribed. We've, we've, we've just mm -hmm. bought more than we need. Uh, and, and we run that for three to five years. Uh, and then it's time for a hardware refresh. Harder refresh life cycles on AWS are a completely different thing. And we'll talk about resizing systems in just a moment. Uh, but it's OK to get things wrong. Just a little bit up front, as Philip alluded to, you can oversize a system and then see how it runs for a week, two weeks, a month, mm -hmm. and then downsize very easily to save costs if you want to. Uh, the, the same thing goes for, let's say AWS comes out with a new uh, virtual machine, new instance type that maybe has a new uh, uh, processor, maybe we've exposed additional instruction sets, uh, maybe capabilities from uh, the CPU. You want to take advantage of those, right? Uh, it, it's very simple to actually do a migration to that without a, a, a lengthy planning cycle. So you, you see that the planning horizon, well, you do want to plan for an outage, obviously. You don't want to take your systems down without telling your, your, your customers, your users. Um, but you really can plan your hardware, uh, your, your capacity needs. Uh, to follow your actual demand. In fact, we have a customer on the East Coast, uh, a, a garden center who, as you can imagine, they have a very seasonal demand, spring uptick. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit of buying going on there. They actually spin up additional dialogue instances or SAP servers to handle that load and then shut them down uh, and save the money when they're not running them. So we've done a lot of work uh, on, the, on the AWS platform uh, and especially with, with regards to SAP to ensure that you have a lot of options when it comes to running your SAP workloads. We've optimized our instance types on various instance families. We have the compute optimized family, which is, as it, as it sounds, it's more weighted towards compute resources. So it has more CPUs or virtual CPUs and less memory. 
We have the uh, general purpose. Uh, we, we see a lot of people using these for non-production uh, SAP workloads where maybe uh, critical performance uh, is not, or, or training environments, sandbox environments. Um, but we also have these available. And then uh, the ones that are used and certified for SAP HANA today are the R3 uh, instance types, and those are, are called our memory optimized. And these are certified by SAP for use for all SAP workloads, whether it's business suite, business warehouse, uh, SAP HANA, uh, and, and the like. Um, we have this concept called uh, cluster networking or enhanced, uh, enhanced uh, networking, which actually uses single root IO virtualization, which is very close from a performance perspective to bare metal, very high packet per second throughput. Um, so it's, it's, very, uh, it's very good for scale out environments when you're talking about ECC with a lot of application servers, or even HANA scale out environments when you're talking about multiple nodes, especially in the BW and, and data mart scenarios. And I've, I've, I've just listed the SAP note here, which got, it has all this information in it. And then today we announced X1. Yes. <laughs> we have a lot of customers that are super excited about this one. And we're excited about it too. We've, we've had a lot of customers come to us asking us, we're running HANA, it's 244 gig is the most you can give us. When are you gonna have more? You have this speed, this agility, this flexibility, but we need more memory, right? And so we've been working really hard for quite a long time and uh, we're excited today to announce, uh, uh, pre-announce X1. Uh, if you were in the keynote, uh, Werner's keynote this morning, we talked about that. So this will be coming soon, more details. Happy to talk to you. Um, I'll, I'll actually give you some information a little bit later on how to contact us um, to get more information about this. But this uh, will we, we'll, we'll support uh, instances up to uh, two terabytes uh, in range, uh, and this will use the latest Intel processors. How performant are these systems? Again, we, we've done a lot of work to optimize all the tiers within uh, the compute platform to ensure performance. And, and SAP HANA, being an in-memory database, does require uh, some very specific things. Memory latency, uh, even though it's an in-memory database, it still requires very fast uh, IOs, IO speed from the disk subsystem. Uh, and so we've done a lot of benchmarking, and uh, we recently completed a benchmarking um, and we're, we're very pleased with the results, and, and this is a, a statement from SAP uh, regarding our 14 node benchmark. Very close, to the, very similar, very close to the uh, SAP Sapphire uh, conference this year. So I talked, or I alluded about uh, how simple hardware refreshes uh, are. Well, how simple are they? Um, so really, all it takes, imagine you have a virtual machine running today on the AWS platform. You've got the physical host, the virtualization layer on our platform, and then you've got your virtual machine. And you can imagine all the storage volumes, these are also virtual, and so they're actually attached to the virtual machine. It's as simple as stopping the virtual machine, going into the console, and saying, I want to change it from this instance type to this instance type. Or you can do it programmatically through an API call. We have some customers doing some very interesting things there. I can, I can talk about that in a moment. And then you start the machine back up, the virtual machine back up. All of those storage volumes automatically get ma mapped back again to that virtual machine, and you're on the new hardware platform. There's no lengthy database migration, thinking about uh, capacity, those types of things. It's a very, very simple thing. The other thing I, that I didn't mention, I meant to, is that you retain all the same IP addressing, same host name, all of that comes along with the virtual machine. Uh, Philip alluded to the work that we've done around automating the SAP HANA deployments. And we have uh, what we call quick starts. And we, we have a, a number of quick starts available today. And what we've tried to do is take very complex software deployments, enterprise software deployments, and make them super simple uh, to deploy in an automated way. What this does is it allows you to take advantages of uh, the, the, the work that we've put into making sure it's architected correctly, whether it's SAP or whether it's a SharePoint installation or Exchange, we've done the work to understand what it takes to run it in a, in a performant way and a secure way. And then we automate it through the use of what's called CloudFormation. Now, CloudFormation is a, a scripting engine uh, that is based on JSON templates. It's basically infrastructure as code. And any of the resources that are, that are available on AWS can be actually orchestrated with CloudFormation. So you can create very, very complex landscapes. And today, uh, 
you can run an SAP HANA installation as little as 30 minutes. And that's either a single node, or if you want to run the full 17 node scale out solution that's supported by SAP today, you can also run that in, seven, in, in uh, about 30 minutes. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It'll be up and running, and then you could start installing your SAP application. For those that are interested, uh, I've, I've included a link here. There is a, a, a pilot that we're running right now, a promotional offer, excuse me, uh, for those that might be interested in taking advantage of testing out HANA whether it's a business suite, business warehouse, or even a standalone data mart type scenario. Philip. It's hard to take a mission critical system such as your customer relationship, customer relationship management system as your very first foray into the cloud. It's hard to do that from a technical perspective it's also hard to do it from a business perspective in that you're making a huge leap of faith. But that's what we did. And the reasons that we were able to do this with a strong support from our executive team came from the data that we were able to show them about the reliability of Amazon's web services. So we firmly believe that we selected the right partner, not just because it's been working, but because of the data analysis we did up front. So for example, when you see at a keynote that Major League Baseball is utilizing SAP and uh, AWS and all of these solutions and are confident going in front of millions of customers every uh, MLB game, you kind of think, well, I could probably do that for, for my organization and not have to be concerned. But we also went a little bit deeper and started examining what is it that makes AWS reliable? And what would it be if we wanted to try to achieve that same level of availability, redundancy, and failover capability in our own environments? And as we went through that, we realized that, that we, we couldn't achieve it at the same price point. But not only that, we would have had to work so many more hours into our project plan, not necessarily from the perspective of, of what the infrastructure team would have to do, but from a testing and regression testing perspective. And then layer that on with our ability to respond to developers saying, all right, I, I've, I've started building my code on this particular version, but SAP's just released a new functionality or module. We'd like to test that. Can we have this second team of developers do that? But give us another instance uh, to test it on. But by the way, make sure that instance has all the same reliability and capabilities of the other instances. We certainly couldn't do that in our own data center. And we certainly couldn't do it with the level of resiliency that exists, not just from a physical hardware perspective, but also from the, the, the speed of backup and recovery, the ability to encrypt the data and uh, move it to different data centers. I mean, these are just uh, capabilities that we have available to us today, uh, as Steve said, just a mouse click away and at a price point that is very affordable, especially for short-term instances. With the many backup and recovery options, we can select what is right for the particular workloads that we're operating in at the particular time in the project life cycle. I've said for many years that a production environment, nobody questions why you want to spend a lot of money on making sure it has speed and performance and uptime and reliability. But if you're doing a complex ERP project, you all know that the biggest expense is the development time through the 12, 14, 18 months of the uh, testing, unit testing, regression testing, writing the code. We, we spend millions of dollars as organizations, some cases tens of millions of dollars, on uh, contractors and uh, third-party providers building out our SAP systems, and yet we give little regard to how available that solution needs to be for the developers who say, oh, it's just development. So if you're a developer, it's production for you, isn't it? That, that environment is your production lifeline. Life you need it available seven by 24. You need that performance. And we can deliver that with AWS today 
which we would probably never have been able to do in a traditional data center infrastructure just because of the sheer cost of deploying the best in class hardware for a, a development system. Recovery point objectives, recovery time objectives. I'm sure that some of you have had the pleasure of working on business continuity plans, disaster recovery plans, and you know how hard it is with these um, very distributed systems with multiple uh, data flows coming in and out to design an architecture that will actually work in the event of a disaster. Steve's gonna talk a little bit more about this. How has Amazon bridged that gap for us and what pieces do we still have to do ourselves uh, in conjunction perhaps with SAP? But the, just the staggering amount of things that they've taken off the table so we no longer are worrying about just, just basic infrastructure operations. What that ends up doing in the long run is it improves our operational posture. It improves our ability to run those business critical applications and not get woken up every night. It has improved our ability to say, that idea that you have, I'm okay with pursuing it because I'm not gonna have to say, all right, that's fine. We've got it up through dev, maybe even unit testing, but now please wait another nine weeks while I build out a production environment because you want this project to continue. I can say, you know what, that environment that you just built, I can just get you a production ready environment with all the capabilities that you need within a matter of, uh, of days. Um, it, it, it's got to the point where for an SAP environment, we spend uh, typically about uh, somewhere 10 business days in the uh, basis world, in the installation, applying of all the patches and all those things and minutes building the server environment and the HANA environment. Whereas in the past, it was sort of the other way around. The long leg in our project plan was making the hardware sizing selections, waiting for the hardware to be delivered, racking, stacking, and all of those uh, things that really were the, the normal five, 10 years ago. And now um, we, we just don't worry about those things. So Steve, perhaps you can elaborate in a little more technical detail on some of those you bet. capabilities. You bet. Uh, so, so for the sake of time, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, on this slide, but uh, we build a lot of redundancy uh, and resiliency into our services. And what, what you'll find is uh, for each service, uh, there are uh, very uh, strict operational uh, targets for us. And we, we do a lot to work uh, the ghost out of the machine, as you would say, right? There's the, we're very relentless on operational uh, reliability. Uh, we have this concept, and I'm sure most are familiar with it, with the concept of regions and availability zones. So 11 uh, regions, or pockets of compute that are scattered across the globe, and then within each region is a number of different data centers, which we call availability zones. Now, a, a single availability zone can actually comprise uh, multiple data centers, but the concept of being able to leverage uh, multiple availability zones for an SAP application is just a bit a of a different concept. So I'll talk about that here in just a moment. One of the, the very basic things that you should be looking at when it comes to uh, just simple, a simple HA solution is this concept of what we call EC2 auto recovery. Now, for those of you that have actually played in the, the, the SAP or the uh, AWS console, You'll notice these things in there that say system status checks, and there's usually a green checkbox or two green check, uh, check marks. What we're doing is we're actually checking constantly the underlying health of the physical host, the, virtual, the software, the virtualization layer, and the connectivity from a network perspective to this physical host. And what we've done is we've actually implemented the ability for you to take recovery actions based on these status checks. And so what happens here? Let's say we have an underlying problem, whether it's a, a physical failure or a network failure or something of this nature. Now typically on premise, what do we do? We either fail over to another box, so we have extra, extra hardware, or we call the, the hardware tech, right? And we have SLAs around that, typically between two and four hours or something of that nature, right? On AWS, you can actually in, implement or orchestrate what's called a CloudWatch alarm with an auto recovery action that says, okay, there was a system check that failed. I'm gonna go ahead and move this virtual machine 
to another physical machine and automatically start it up. And if you've taken the steps to actually ensure that the SAP instances them themselves, so there are profile parameters within SAP, you can actually modify to auto start the SAP systems. What you find is that you actually have a system that is automatically migrated to another physical host and brought back up. So you're talking about an outage that, talk, uh, that is uh, roughly equal to uh, the time it takes to shut down and boot up a machine versus uh, potentially hours. So this is a very simple thing. This is an, a single availability zone type HA solution. But this is uh, no additional cost, something you really should look at. And it's applicable for any workload. It doesn't have to be SAP. And as I alluded, we have this concept of multi-availability zones for high availability. If you think about SAP systems, typically in a single data center, we're using some sort of uh, cluster solution with a shared storage, so uh, uh, double, double the cost from a hardware perspective, but it's still contained within a single data center. So if, if something catastrophic happens in the data center, then we're looking at a DR solution, right? With availability zones at AWS, we have such high-speed fiber uh, low latency connections between availability zones, you can actually arch architect an SAP system across multiple data centers. So have application servers in multiple data centers, uh, replicate the on queue server so that you're not losing application level locks, and then use database replication technology, whether it's HANA system replication for HANA, Oracle Data Guard for Oracle, or any other solution depending on the database choice, such that, again, you have uh, a synchronous replication solution so that you're not losing any data. And you can do this across data centers such that you can lose a data center. And it's blurring, really, the lines between high availability and DR. And that's, that's something that's pretty interesting. And we have it uh, well described uh, on, in, in the, uh, the high availability guide. And, and, and lastly, and I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but then you can actually extend this concept to DR solutions in another region. So I mentioned we have 11 regions. So take HANA system replication as an example. So in, in a region, you can use HANA system replication in asynchronous mode to protect you within a region. So you'd have a primary and secondary within a region, two different data centers. And then replicate to a third in a different region for disaster recovery. And again, this is, this is something that works with other database choices as well. So what we find is that the native AWS services can really help reduce unplanned downtime. In addition, we can resolve unplanned downtime events more quickly, as I, as I alluded to with the EC2 auto recovery. We can even architect different, different types of HA solutions. And in turn, this increases total or overall application availability, uh, reducing the need for employees to actually spend troubleshooting or, or fixing problems or actually waiting for the hardware guy to come and repair a solution. And in turn, that's, that's just more money you can invest into your core business. So that's, that's what we, uh, we love to invest in. And, and why we're, we're excited about customers like Brooks Brothers running on, on AWS. Maybe you can desc describe the, the cost profile to us here. So cost in AWS has a variety of things that you have to consider. First and foremost, you have those uh, new costs if you are trying to migrate a workload, right? So you've got your existing infrastructure in place, and now you're building up a parallel infrastructure that you're going to migrate into. So what, what do you have to be concerned about? You've got to be concerned about the, the, the data moving. You have to be concerned about the amount of storage space that you're going to consume. How many uh, times you're going to have to run different uh, migration scenarios before, that you're, before you're ready to pull the plug. If you're starting from scratch, building it in AWS with uh, no, no uh, initial data, you're guessing on your sizing, potentially. You do not necessarily know the amount of information that's going to be having to flow in. You may have a, a huge peak as you try different transformation scenarios uh, to move legacy information into a new install. So what, what, what you get with the, the cost calculators, with a number of the partners out there who offer a variety of different tools to help you manage and maintain that uh, cost structure, is the ability to reduce the amount of wasted resources that you have out there. If you're doing a whole bunch of data tests and performance isn't that important to you, you can use very inexpensive compute clusters 
and obviously the, the, the lower end of storage. And then you can migrate those later with that whole process of just you know, shutting down the instance and changing the instance type. See if this clicker will behave itself. The other thing that we found very helpful is what I call a temporary throwaway system. So developer comes up with a scenario that typically in a project lifecycle you would have said, okay, get in line, right? I've, I've got these things that have to happen this week. We'll slot you in in week three and four in the project. Now I can say, okay, I hear what it is that you want to do. I'm going to have to clone four systems, migrate some data for you, go up to the cost calculator. Okay, that is going to cost $1,300 to run that system for the next three weeks. Now it's a question for the project manager. Do you want to invest $1,300 in this developer's idea? If you do, great, just let me know. So I'm no longer the bad guy saying, I don't have enough resources, I can't do what you want me to do, I don't think that's advisable, I'm just, sure, just let me know. I do like this feature, and I think anybody that's been using AWS has got to be one of the best things, is the automatic price drops. This concept that it doesn't matter how big of an organization you are, you're going to get treated fairly within the AWS ecosystem. So as the cost of hardware goes down over time, their scale is so large that they can pass that right on to you. I'm sure that everyone has got systems in their data center that they bought at just the wrong time, right? That you uh, paid high and now you're, you've either leased it at the wrong lease rate or you've got it sitting there and the solution has expired in, uh, and no longer as valuable as it was when it was first put in, you can never recoup those costs for your organization. So the built-in price drops, the flexibility, all of those things really do add value to the organization. And the more complex, the larger, the more you move into AWS, the bigger those benefits are for your company's bottom line. The flexible EC2 instances enable you to produce a, a, a set of operating models for your own internal organization. You can decide what it is that I want to put in a particular instance type. Just like when we migrated from physical infrastructure to virtual infrastructure, the uh, operations team starts to make educated calculations. They're not really going to know if I only give them you know, two gig of RAM and they ask for four. And if it does start to run slow and I see that performance drop, I can just change it and they'll never know. So you find yourself uh, being far less conservative in the deployment of solutions than you ever were in the VM space and just so much different than you were when you were using physical infrastructure. So why SAP on AWS? It's a supported platform. I think for anybody that is trying to uh, run a major production SAP workload, you understand that if it's not a supported platform, you're going to have a very, very hard time when it comes to any kind of upgrade, any kind of OSS note that you've got to read, every support call. Plus, if performance takes a drop and your executives start asking for explanations, you don't want it to be a conversation about the infrastructure. You don't want it to be a conversation about how you tried something to lower costs and didn't quite work out right. Something that we have found very helpful is that within the SAP community, there's a lot of sharing of thoughts and ideas. There are lots of customer roundtables, advisory councils, there's uh, um, different uh, online forums where you can exchange information. And within that community, we're starting to see now an AWS-specific SAP community. Uh, there are a lot of us doing this thing, and we're not afraid to share ideas and information with one another. We found that particularly comforting for ourselves, and we're glad to participate in this forum to try to share with you some of our experiences. And we really enjoy the ability to change direction at any time. There are so many decisions that I've made in the last six months on AWS, particularly with regard to our next solution, which is the FMS, the, the, the fashion management solution. We have uh, deployed six different versions of FMS configurations in the last 10 weeks. 
Each one of those had a HANA instance. Each one of those had the largest HANA instance available, even if it was for a very short time period. I don't have enough money in my budget to do that in the on-premise data center, let alone enough time to do that in a project life cycle. So our ability to say, okay, I'm gonna install FMS without simple finance, and then two weeks later, get a call from the SAP team, say, you wanna reconsider that decision not to install it with simple finance and be able to rapidly go back to a snapshot before I started loading data in and layer in simple finance and uh, please the developer community. That, 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 that's gold to an infrastructure guy. We have choice. You know, choice in the, the marketplace of, of cloud providers certainly uh, is large. SAP themselves has many offerings. Pretty much every cloud provider out there has solutions. But when we looked at the AWS value proposition, it meant not only being able to run SAP in a certified environment, but all of the other things that are going to interconnect with SAP. And every week we see just new partners coming online. We were chatting with our, our PBX provider about, well, there's some virtualization options. Can we use some of those in AWS? We're seeing pretty much every security provider that we've leveraged over the years coming up with instances that we can spin up on AWS. The marketplace is layering in more and more solutions that we can just select and uh, get immediate value out of it. So the, the choices that we had there were, were, were pretty significant. And the deep SAP expertise, that's something that you really can't, uh, can't put a price tag on to be able to call into the uh, ecosystem there at uh, Amazon and get, get assistance. So all of those things kind of uh, wrapped it up for us that we had uh, uh, made the right decision to use AWS to run our SAP environment. So Philip, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you mm -hmm. to stay there, and I'm going to skip a few of these slides here, sure. because I think that there's a, a few key elements that I, I think that would be very interesting for, for customers to hear from you. Uh, what I'm depicting here is just the, the trajectory of the SAP certified solutions that are available today on, on AWS to give you an idea of kind of where we started and where we've ended uh, most recently with uh, S4 HANA and, and scale out solutions for, for, uh, for SAP. And again, the, we have a, a broad range of solutions available today for SAP HANA. Whether you're a developer, someone who wants to develop an in-memory application that's native for HANA, uh, or you want to run the, a bring-your-own-license version like uh, Brooks Brothers has done. And then again, as, as Philip alluded, we have an extensive partner network uh, for various variety of activities. I'll let you talk about uh, kind of the end result. Yeah, so for, for us, that end result has just been the right answers at the right time for our business executives to deliver solutions. So we got to production in a record time frame, about three months. We transformed the IT capabilities. All of the engineers that got to work on this learned something that they didn't know going into this environment that they were incredibly happy about. And uh, just the, we were afraid, I think, when we first started this, that our infrastructure team would be concerned about, how's this changing my job? Am I going to be displaced by uh, an Amazon robot drone type thing? And they've really kind of calmed down and, uh, and embraced this. We were able to uh, meet our security and compliance for our audit and continue to obtain coverage for cyber risk insurance. They were very, very concerned, detailed, detailed questionnaire about what we were doing with Amazon, how we were leveraging it, how we were securing it, and we got, uh, got full marks for what we were doing there. And the, the, the really the, the big win here is that our resources that would have been working on uh, basic blocking and tackling within infrastructure can now be spent on our core competencies. And we really want to get into that. How do we improve the application performance? How do we optimize the data structures in HANA? How does our basis team spend more time with the developers up front trying to enable solutions instead of troubleshooting on the back end? Those are the, our results. And I think that uh, anybody can get them if you're, if you're a little bit bold in what you select to put into AWS at the, at the beginning. 
because the, the, the more complex a solution, the more you're forced to solve some of these things up front and then you get the, those benefits a lot quicker. And bonus, our users and our internal uh, folks in infrastructure are actually a lot happier about what they can achieve for the customers. And we have a foundation that we can leverage for our future applications. And we have a lot planned, including using those new X1 instances. We can easily see us uh, calling up and asking for something a lot bigger than two terabytes now. Fair enough. So keys to success, I know we're really short on time here, but engage those infrastructure engineers up front, give them the value proposition, sell them on what this is for their career. They will lead you at such a pace that you'll be able to achieve those business benefits very quickly. Motivate and lead to the cloud by encouraging those engineers to embrace the opportunities that come with the new solutions. Educate them, you know, let them come to these conferences, encourage them to look at the resources online and they will uh, em embrace the techniques, for example, the, the, the automated scripts that you can leverage. They might start coming up and doing new DevOps things that you didn't even know that they could accomplish. And encourage exploration. That uh, really is a, is a value enabler for your organization. If you take some of that time that you've saved and let the engineers reinvest it into producing new solutions, then you'll have a, uh, an organization that is not only cloud ready, but cloud optimized from a people perspective. And re reward the results, right? That kind of uh, is, uh, is very basic. We keep going? Yeah, I think we're just about there. So summary, cloud first. I think if you take that largest of your workloads and move them into the cloud first, those benefits that you get will outweigh the perceived risks. You wanna engage those technical teams early on because when you do, they will uh, help you solve big problems, uh, particularly around that network design. You need to get that figured out early on because you've got a lot of data that you're gonna move into the cloud. Uh, now you have things that we didn't have. Snowball uh, looks really exciting. Make sure you design for the outcomes that you're looking for. If you want a short time frame on your development project, that, then put those resources in there. If you really care about transforming your solutions, then look at multiple and parallel development tracks where you can accelerate solutions. And then, you know, right partner, very happy uh, with our decision. And, you know, re-architect where you can, right? I mean, not every project gives you the, the flexibility to do that. Sometimes you're stuck with legacy solutions, but if you can, re-architect it because then you get those cost benefits much quicker. So Philip, what's next for you guys? So next for us is uh, FMS, and then after that, we're gonna migrate our ECC solution into AWS, and then following that along with our business warehouse, business objects, and uh, once everything SAP is in there, then we can start looking at the non-SAP stuff. But we really wanted to go in big with where the value for moving the company forward is located as opposed to really just uh, saving a little bit from an infrastructure perspective. It's outstanding. I definitely appreciate your insights. Um, so there, there is a plethora of information that is available, and we're definitely happy to, to speak to any of you. You can reach out and contact us through this contact us uh, form that's on our, on our website. Philip, it's certainly a pleasure. I, I appreciate you, you coming today and just telling customers your experience and being transparent there. It's, it's been a pleasure. Well, thanks for having us, and thanks for being a valued Thank partner. Thank you for coming. Thank you.